coal and oil won't last forever. The question of how long they might continue to provide energy for the human race seems to get a different answer from everyone you ask it to. But it's almost unanimously agreed that we have to end our dependency on fossil fuels if we want our race and planet to survive. How do we go about that replacement process, though? What sources of fuel and energy might we consider? Find out all about the options in this fantastic video. As a starting point, let's talk about the tremendous potential of hydrogen energy. Hydrogen might be the easiest raw material to work with when it comes to producing energy. It's environmentally friendly, it's enormously versatile, and most importantly of all, it doesn't produce any carbon dioxide whatsoever when it's combusted. The only product of hydrogen combustion are heat and water, both of which we can find an immediate use for. As an energy source, hydrogen could completely decarbonize the production of electricity. It's easy to store, it can be transported anywhere in the world safely, and it can even be blended with current fuels to create hybrid energy sources. When you factor all of these things together, it isn't hard to understand why some experts believe that hydrogen isn't just the future of energy, it's the present. Several hydrogen energy trials are already taking place all over the world, with early results from the Scottish Orkney Islands appearing to be very promising. We'd get all of the power output with none of the CO2 production, so why shouldn't we make the change? We're staying in the British Isles for a moment, because that's where we'll find another remarkable and promising renewable energy project, one that's even more natural than working with hydrogen. This is all about harnessing the awesome power of the tides and creating tidal steam energy. Recently, funding and approval were granted for a project known as the Tidal Steam Industry Energizer Project, or TIGER for short. It will see the installation of tide harnessing equipment in the body of water, known as the English Channel, between the south coast of England and the north coast of France. The premise is a simple one. A series of turbines will be submerged into the water, and they'll convert the power of the moving water into electrical energy. It's hoped that during this initial stage, around 8 megawatts of power will be generated. That's enough to power thousands of homes. If the Tiger project is successful, the model could be replicated in other coastal regions and reduce dependency on traditional forms of energy production. That's two amazing energy projects happening in the British Isles. But it's not all about Britain. In August 2019, an exciting deal was struck between the governments of Germany and Ghana to build a brand new high-tech biogas plant at the cost of $7 million. The plant will be less productive than the Tiger project with a maximum output of 400 kilowatts. But there's an important distinction to be made. This plant is going to produce electricity exclusively from waste products. The promising deal calls for one plant to be built in Germany by the end of 2023, with a larger plant to be built in Ghana a few years later if the German plant is as successful as it's expected to be. The scientifically minded among you might be interested to know what the process of turning the waste products into energy will involve the use of biogas, pyrolysis, and a hybrid solar photovoltaic system. This collaborative effort will include three German research companies, three existing Ghanaian industrial centers, and a further six Ghanaian research centers. This is international action. We've all known about the potential of solar energy for many years, but the general consensus is that solar power isn't enough to replace the production capacity of dirtier methods. To find out whether or not that's true, Let's look at the Mojave Solar Power Station in the desert of California, USA. Covering an area of almost 9 square miles, this is the largest solar power facility in the world. Facilities like this admittedly don't come cheaply. Thus far, it's estimated that it's cost the state of California approximately $2 billion to create and maintain the station. In return, it's producing around 30% of all the thermal energy in the entire country. At its core, the station is made up of three 500-foot-tall towers surrounded by 300,000 mirrors, reflecting sunlight back at the towers. That thermal energy is then directed into a water reservoir, which in turn generates steam and drives a turbine, feeding into a generator. The water circulates through the system multiple times and cleans the mirrors in the process. At present, 
it produces 392 megawatts of power. And with more towers and mirrors planned, that will increase in the future. Ghana isn't the only African nation experimenting with clean, renewable energy. Kenya has also started to experiment with new fuel sources. And in late 2015, it embarked upon the largest wind energy project in African history. Power consumption in Kenya is increasing rapidly. And in recent years, we've seen repeated interruptions in the country's power grid as demand outstrips supply. Wind farms like this might prove to be the solution to the problem. The first stage of the project was the completion of the Lake Turkana Wind Power Project, which was completed by the end of 2016 and now produces 20% of all the country's power. The full project, presuming that the plan is followed through all the way to completion, will result in thousands of wind turbines producing a staggering 5,000 megawatts of power. That would make Kenya's energy problems a thing of the past and hopefully provide inspiration for other nations around the world to make similar changes. The only barrier is the cost. The Lake Turkana installation alone cost almost $700 million and required third-party investments and borrowing to get the job done. Returning to the idea of solar energy, our next idea is part solar power station and part art exhibition. Feast your eyes on the Solar Hourglass. As designed for the 2014 Land Art Generator Initiative Copenhagen Design Competition by Argentinian artist Santiago Muros Cortez in 2014, tourists would be welcome to walk across the structure's lower bulb and shelter from the sun during the day, while the upper bulb would be busy harnessing the energy of the sun to provide power for hundreds of homes around the hourglass. The principle is the same as the one we see with the Mojave solar plant. The dish at the top receives focused heat from mirrors and transfers that heat down into a water tank to produce steam and drive a turbine. Some of the steam would even be forced back up through a central beam between the two bulbs, where it would appear as a bright shaft of solar energy. Right now, this structure is little more than an artist's dream. But there's nothing in his blueprint that can't be created in real life, and therefore, no reason why we shouldn't see a solar hourglass in a city near you in the future. We've already seen the impressive wind turbines of Kenya, but now we're headed back to the UK to take a look at the largest wind turbines in the world, which were switched on for the first time in early 2017. Just one single revolution of the blades on a single one of these turbines is enough to power an average British home for more than 24 hours. There are 32 of them to be found in the waters of Liverpool Bay, each of which stands 640 feet tall if measured all the way down to the base. Even the blades are enormous, extending more than 250 feet away from the center. Taken together, the Liverpool Bay turbines generate 8 megawatts of power. There's been a wind farm in this location for more than a decade, but the older, smaller turbines were replaced by Danish company Dong Energy three years ago. 8 megawatts isn't quite enough to power the entire thriving city of Liverpool, but further development and refinement of wind power in the future might make that a possibility. In the meantime, Dong intends to build more giant turbines and add to the collection. Let's go all the way to the other side of the world from England and check out the Ungata Mariki Geothermal Power Plant in Taupo, New Zealand. This vast, sprawling facility cost almost $500 million to create and is advertised as the largest singular binary power plant on the planet. It's not up to full capacity yet, but when it is, it's expected to generate something in the region of 700 gigawatt hours of electricity each year. To put that in relative terms, it's enough power to supply about 80,000 average homes. Seven geothermal wells exist at the plant, three of which are for production, and the remaining four of which are used for reinjection. All of them are more than 10,000 feet deep. A further 21 monitoring wells of half that depth have been dug alongside them. At the bottom of the production wells, the temperature is 290 degrees Celsius. That's over 550 Fahrenheit, and more than enough heat to create high-pressure vapor to drive the plant's turbines. The advantage of geothermal power, as opposed to solar energy, is that the sun goes down every day. But the center of the Earth remains boiling hot. New Zealand's 
Ngatamariki plant might be the largest singular binary power plant in the world. But it's not the biggest geothermal power plant of them all. That honor goes to the Geysers Geothermal Complex in California, USA. This is less of a geothermal power plant and more of a geothermal field, split into 22 different plants and containing a staggering 350 different wells. The total production capacity of this gargantuan facility is 1,517 megawatts. The complex didn't end up here by accident. There's a magma chamber four miles below the surface of the Earth in this part of California, and it covers an area of eight square miles. That made it the perfect place to dig wells, and also one of the first places in the world that experiments with geothermal energy began. There was a primitive geothermal plant here as long ago as 1921. Back then, it could only produce 250 kilowatts of power, and it was used to power the lights at a tourist resort on the land. By 1999, the site was much larger, but the steam field had begun to run dry. The problem was solved by injecting sewage into the geothermal area, piped in from a wastewater treatment plant 50 miles away. It sounds weird, but it works. Not all gas energy is dirty. It's possible to create energy from clean sources of natural gas, and that was the whole point of the expansion of the Surgutskaya GRES-2 power plant in 2011. This is the single largest power station in all of Russia, supplying power to around 40% of the country's entire population. Whereas the six older generators at the plant used dried oil gas, the two newer blocks consume only natural gas using a combined cycle, resulting in an efficiency rate of 56%, and thereby reducing carbon dioxide emissions by 2 million tons per year. Emissions of nitrous oxide are also reduced to less than 50 milligrams per cubic meter, which is low enough to be considered safe to breathe. The expansion was consistent with the Russian government's plan to incrementally reduce the country's dependency on dirty sources of energy. But the labor came from abroad. The new generators were both manufactured and supplied by the American General Electric Company. It's an excellent example of cooperation between Americans and Russians, working together for a more sustainable future. Here's another fact that might surprise you. Just as it's possible to create a clean gas power station, it's also possible to create a clean coal power station. We know that because one was built in Beijing, China in 2019, and they didn't go into the project half-heartedly. In fact, this is the largest clean coal power generation system in the world. There's a drawback in the way that the power station is still dependent on coal, and coal supplies will eventually run out, as we mentioned earlier. But improvements and changes made to the station's coal power generators have resulted in a decrease of 86% in sulfur dioxide emissions, and nearly 90% less nitrogen oxide emissions. Perhaps more importantly for the people of Beijing, it's resulted in 85% less production of smoke, which makes the whole city a nicer place to be. If we must continue using dirtier, non-renewable forms of energy in the short term, at least we now know for sure that we can do it in cleaner and more environmentally friendly ways than we do right now. Elsewhere in China, you'll find the enormous Three Gorges Dam. This hydroelectric gravity dam sits on the world-famous Yangtze River and has held the title of being the world's biggest power station in terms of capacity since 2012. That capacity is an astonishing 22,500 megawatts. Creating a facility this large is a long, slow process. The body of the dam was finished by 2006, but the power plant wasn't ready to be switched on until 2012. The 32 primary turbines that make up the dam are paired with two generators, providing the plant with its power. It even powers the enormous ship lift at the site. Producing clean energy was only one aspect of the brief for the workers who created the Three Gorges Dam. They were also told to increase the river's shipping capacity by providing flood storage space. And they've succeeded in that task admirably. It's definitely green and definitely clean. But creating the plant involved displacing over one million people from their homes. So the question of whether that was a worthwhile trade-off is up to you to answer. Subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, and enjoy watching new videos on my channel. 
Thanks for watching and see you soon.